Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom of heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. During this time, the family of believers was a company of about 120 persons. Peter stood among them and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture that the Holy Spirit announced beforehand through David had to be fulfilled. This was the scripture concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. This happened even though he was one of us and received his share of this ministry. Therefore, we must select one of those who have accompanied us, accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus lived among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when Jesus was taken from us. The person must become, along with us, a witness to his resurrection. So they nominated two, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. They prayed, Lord, you know everyone's deepest thoughts and desires. Show us clearly which one you have chosen from among these two to take the place of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. When they cast lots, the lot fell on Matthias. He was added to the 11 apostles. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people. Happy are they whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Happy are they whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. Happy are they whose delight is in the law of the Lord. They are like trees planted by streams of water, Bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Happy are they whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Happy are they whose delight is in the law of the A reading from the first letter of John. If we receive human testimony, God's testimony is greater because this is what God testified. He has testified about his son. The one who believes in God's son has the testimony within. The one who doesn't believe God has made God a liar because that one has not believed the testimony that God gave about his son. And this is the testimony God gave eternal life to us, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have God's Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of God's Son, so that you can know that you have eternal life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks. 
The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus prayed for his disciples, saying, I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. This is because I gave them the words that you gave me, and they received them. They truly understood that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you gave me, because they are yours. Everything that is mine is yours, and everything that is yours is mine. I have been glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, even as I'm coming to you. Holy Father, watch over them in your name, the name you gave me, that they will be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I watched over them in your name, the name you gave to me, and I kept them safe. None of them were lost except the one who was destined for destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now I'm coming to you and I say these things while I'm in the world so that they can share completely in my joy. I gave your word to them and the world hated them because they don't belong to this world just as I don't belong to this world. I'm not asking that you take them out of this world but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world just as I don't belong to this world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world so that I have sent them into the world. I made myself holy on their behalf so that they also would be made holy in the truth. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Today is the last Sunday of Easter. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a break from the Gospel of John. Don't get me wrong, I love John's mysticism, but sometimes I finish the passage and just think, dude, what are you trying to say? The gospel passage from today is from the high priestly prayer, which is a very long address that Jesus gives to his disciples in John after the Last Supper. It's basically the longest, most convoluted graduation speech ever. This prayer is so important though, that we read from it every year. The lectionary divides this prayer into three parts. So we read the first part one year and the second part, the middle part, that's today's part one year, and then the final part another year. It, that's right, it's so long, it has three parts. And this is, like I said, the middle part. In a way, this prayer is John's version of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus offers as he's teaching his disciples how to pray. But at least daily bread and forgive us our sins are a little bit more concrete. This prayer in John, though, is less of a lesson in how to pray than it is a glimpse into Jesus' own prayer life. In this prayer, we get to eavesdrop on Jesus as he pours his heart out to God. We get to hear the desires and petitions of his heart. Isn't it funny to think about Jesus as a person who prays? We often think about Jesus as the one with the answers. So this prayer reminds us of the mutuality in the heart of God. There's both taking and giving. Jesus is God, and Jesus is both recipient and giver. God is both recipient and giver. It always goes both ways with God, giving and receiving within the dynamic dance of the Trinity and with each one of us. So what is the prayer of Jesus's heart? There are two things that stand out for me here, unity and identity. It's so clear all throughout John that the heart of the faith is unity, unity with God and unity with one another. In Christ, we all become one. It's that simple and it's that hard. It's the other part, identity, that I wanna focus on today. The word that appears most often in today's gospel passage is the word cosmos or world, which shows up 13 times in nine verses. That is a lot. But it's important to note that I don't think the crafter of the Johannine gospel or Jesus is saying that the world is bad, but I do think Jesus is making a true observation. What Jesus is talking about is two different ways of being. 
One way of being is Jesus's way. For those who have embraced this vision of ultimate unity with God and one another. Another way of being is the default way, the unexamined way, the reflexive way of the world that is primarily about me and mine and only sees division and separation between my group and anyone who is unlike me. That is not Jesus's vision. Jesus's vision is oneness, oneness almost beyond our imagination. And this distinction matters. He's not talking about one group, his followers over here and those other people over there and asking for this group to be protected while not really caring about this other group. What he is saying is that this group, his group, his people are ones who get it. Through their relationship with God, through their closeness with Jesus, they have seen a vision of this kingdom, of unity, of love without distinction. But not all of creation has caught that vision yet. When he prays for his followers to be protected, to be watched over in his name, he's not asking them to get a magic pass on suffering while everybody else gets a double dose. The way Jesus's name is used here, it's similar to the essence of Jesus. I think what he's asking for is this. His followers have gotten a firsthand look at Jesus's mission and ministry. And even when the disciples don't entirely get it, this group of people does realize that there's something to this deep, deep love of Jesus. They have been transformed by their encounter with him by being exposed to his essence and his name and his breath and his healing hands and his eyes. Can you think of Jesus's eyes, the warmth and compassion that must have radiated from them? Jesus here is asking that those who have been transformed by being close to his ministry be sustained in their new way of being that their mountaintop experience is not this cool thing that happened once when they followed this washed up carpenter around Galilee for a few years. He's pleading for this sense of transformation to be protected, to be maintained, for his followers to keep their sense of identity even when he physically leaves their presence. He doesn't want them to revert to the old way, the other way, the limited, less connected way they lived, before love itself took on flesh and moved into their neighborhood. He wants their openness, their oneness, their channel to the transformative love of God to stay open forever. So the desire for protection in this prayer is not because the world is bad. Instead, it's because Jesus knows the world desperately needs his kind of love and deeply desires his followers stay open to the living breath of God flowing in and through them. So he doesn't hate the world. Indeed, he wants it all transformed, transformed by love. I was bummed to miss Caroline Miller's sun print workshop last week, but this gospel reading got me thinking about the special kind of light sensitive paper you use to create sun print images. For those of you who also missed the workshop, you place objects like flowers or feathers on special paper, and then you expose that paper to the light. The paper changes in the sunlight, leaving behind images where your objects were shielding the paper. My extremely limited understanding of how this works chemically is that there are compounds, pigments within the surface of the paper itself that undergo a chemical reaction when they come in contact with UV rays. In fact, you have to arrange these papers in a windowless room because the moment those compounds are exposed to sunlight, even if it's a cloudy day, the reaction begins and change starts to happen. There's a second chemical reaction that happens when the paper is dipped in water and those embedded pigments take on that brilliant signature blue color. Through this process, Simple sunlight and paper and flowers found in a ditch are transformed into art and beauty and a meaningful story. What if this is what Jesus means? 
What if his followers are like those special molecules in that paper? The whole paper isn't made of those molecules, but just enough. Just enough molecules are different from what's around them. Just enough molecules are responsive to the light. Just enough molecules undergo a post-exposure transformation, a permanent transformation, to leave the world, the paper, the surface, more beautiful and more meaningful than before. In this image, the paper is not bad. The world is not bad, it's just different. It's a waiting transformation. It's in need of something special, a smattering of molecules that feed on the light of the sun. Perhaps Jesus's prayer, his vision, is that those sun responsive molecules remember what they are. Remember what they can do. Remember that they are capable of transformation and in fact are already being transformed for the sake of the world. The world, the cosmos, as John renders it, is marked by division and disunity. That is the air we breathe, my friends. Fear and suspicion and self-righteousness and anger. Those who live according to the way of the cosmos the world are either unaware of the possibility of a different way of being or reject that possibility. We are different. We have been exposed to something different. What we have been exposed to is this, the power of love to transform. Love of God, love of others, love of creation, love of self. All of those loves linked and lived out together change us change the world and transform it into something better and something different than it was before. As you come to this table, imagine being exposed to the sun. Imagine undergoing a transformation, not by changing from yellow or white to a brilliant blue, but by being transformed from your one self into a network of selves a network of love and justice and mercy and peace that covers everything. And imagine that network creating a full image of Jesus's way of being right here in Little Rock in May of 2024. Imagine being sent out from this place transformed. Imagine making small choices that align the very molecules of your being with Jesus's way of being. Imagine that alignment helping you live your life in tiny, beautiful, holy ways. Ways that cause someone to say, how is it that you see the world? Can you tell me about the love that I see radiating from your life? I want to become that beautiful too.
Thank you.